I'm Daniel Mendez, and this is my story. Uh, I was born in 1984, and I grew up here in Chicago in Ukrainian Village. I was actually born at the Norwegian Hospital right here in Humble Park. So I grew up in Ukrainian Village, but um, going to Clemente High School, mm -hmm. um, I remember growing up there was a lot of there were still a lot of things and changes happening to where my parents had some fear of Humble Park. So even with other people, there was that don't go past Western <laughs> type of thing. Um, but going to Clemente, a lot of my friends lived in Humble Park. So I was in Humble Park pretty much all the time. Uh, so it's nice, especially working here, being back in the neighborhood that um, I felt connected with. He was a very shy, quiet, overweight geek. Uh, I remember, so I was homeschooled most of my childhood until uh, I was age seven that I started school in second grade. Um, but I didn't really understand like why I had to raise my hand to use the bathroom, why I had to write a word 20 times if I already knew how to spell it because it was homework. So sometimes I didn't do homework because I didn't know. <laughs> um, but I was pretty much a straight A student. Um, I was top of the reading class. I loved spelling bees. I loved uh, studying history, um, but I was really quiet. So I had a lot of friends, but in terms of talking about my life, who I am, even being able to present or speak or stand up for myself, that was something I never did as a child. Apart from not paying bills, um, my... You know, it's hard to say what I miss. Uh, a lot of things from childhood is I grew up um, with both my parents and a lot of times during the weekends they would my family would take us to kitty land it was my sister and I um, we would go to the parks and eat food um, but also it was just nice having those times together because um, growing up also my mom was suffering through a lot of depression so a lot of times we would um, my dad would just take us out to the parks or we would go out together um, but we would just stay in the car and eat just go someplace by the lake um, and it was one of those things where even though there was a lot of stress and hecticness in my childhood, um, in my home, um, I remember those moments as just feeling okay. Like there was, I didn't have worries like I do now. Uh, I have a sister. I have a sister. She's five years older. And we actually, we were best friends growing up. And something happened around when I got into high school. Um, we just kind of stopped talking. She separated from the family for a bit. Um, so for years, it was like I, I was an only child after that. Um, but it's only been the last, say, four or five years that her and I actually reconnected. Being the youngest, it was it was weird. Just like any siblings, there was always that fighting um, to the point to where sometimes we would spit at each other or whatnot, like yell. And thankfully, we, we had a big enough house. We had three floors. Um, I had a back apart, like it was a very interesting layout, um, but it was good because she did respect me. She, you know, I remember when I was a kid, she would help me do some of my homework, which was funny. Or, you know, she would invite me to the movies and that was the first time I went to a movie theater when I was maybe like 12 or 13. And I think it was While You Were Sleeping was the first movie we saw. Um, so we were actually really close. Um, so yeah, it, it was nice being younger. Um, and growing up, it was just different though, because I realized that was, you know, I feel like parents always with their first child do whatever they can, but then they learn with the second child. But I felt like it was just, nobody's perfect. And it's kind of my, in retrospect, I'm just learning to embrace the imperfections of my childhood instead of just thinking about how everything was great. It was nice. It was nice um, to be blunt. Um, there was a lot of times where there would be arguments or things would happen, again, in any home, in every home, that's going to happen. Um, but a part of me thinks it would have been great had they separated, because I think independently they would have been stronger as parents and independently they would have uh, built each other up a lot better. Um, but it was nice having them because my dad was always super supportive. Uh, they always wanted me to follow any dream I wanted, even though they still guided me in directions that they wanted. 
um, at the end of the day, they were supportive. And to this day, um, so my father passed away about, uh, it'll be about four years. Um, but my mom, even to this day, supportive, whatever job I do, whatever I do, she has my back and um, she's always there. So, you know, it's, it's nice that um, growing up with both my parents, I was able to have that relationship because I, I understand not everybody can say that they had loving parents. I've gone through a lot of hard moments. Um, I'd say one of them was when my father passed because he was already having a lot of complications with his health. So um, he had a double coronary bypass, he had prostate cancer, um, he had like, his chemo treatment, he had trouble with water in his lungs, and it was a mix of things. So he was constantly in the hospital. And this final time he was in ICU, um, my, my mom and I went home because we were there for about two days and literally the Uber ride back is when I got the call that he had passed. So we, um, my spirituality is a little bit different, including my mom. So um, when we went to go see him, we actually um, like blessed him, anointed him. So it's still, a, it's an image I can't escape out of my head. So I'm grateful I was there, but it was really tough. Um, I've had a couple other moments, but that's the one that can replay. And it's that I don't feel much when I think of that now sometimes, because it was, I, after he died, I like to say I blacked out for about three, four months. Like I took about a week or two from work. Um, but when I got back, I don't really remember much of those days. And I got to the point where I started drinking heavily where I almost got let go from both my jobs when I was bartending and uh, working at another agency. Um, but thankfully I had a boss that was really supportive and she just knocked some sense into me, got some accountability and it actually helped push me to get therapy, which is what I've been doing since. Just dealing with it, understanding it, um, they always say it's not easy the first year, and it doesn't get easier, but it's not as hard, and it's true. It's it's weird to say coping, because that's something I, somebody I think about every day, but I don't realize how much time passes. Um, so I just continue on with life. Um, it sounds really horrible, but I've, apart from my dad, I've lost well around the tens to fifteens of number of friends. Um, over the last few years. It was challenging um, because my mom does have uh, a number of mental illnesses diagnosed, um, but she wasn't on any treatment. So while she, around the first couple years, uh, there were moments where she would still need things. I think as any parent, like, can you do this? Can you run to the store? Can you grab this for me? Um, but once it was so much pressure that I, I just snapped back and I cried but yelled on the phone like, I can't keep doing this. And it was just overwhelming for me. And it was also like not give some sense to her as well. And that stopped. Um, but then there was a period uh, recently where um, she was going through a lot more of like questions of like um, a lot more paranoia, um, things that were real, but things that weren't. So it was just hard to maneuver that. Um, but my sister actually stepped in and now my mom lives with her and my mom, she looks drastically different. She doesn't cover her hair anymore. She dresses better now. She actually is going for walks again. She went to the park the other day. She went to the zoo, like she's doing things. And, you know, having that dynamic of not with my dad anymore, it was tough because I just wish I could ask questions. Um, but spiritually, um, with the way I, I try to stay connected, um, I've had a lot of help. And it seems like at least, you know, God and spirits and um, just a lot of things are, are good that I can't forget about. So it's kind of a tough way to answer the question, uh, but the dynamic has been uh, different, but uh, it's getting better from what it seems. It's so weird because a lot of people, I feel like that should be an easy question.
question for people to answer. And it's really hard for me. Um, not to say that I don't have happy moments. I, there's a lot of things I'm really happy about. Like I'm happy with my partner. Um, I love my apartment and have been decorating it and setting it up. It's gorgeous. Um, you know, when I help, uh, when I help a colleague, whether it's a staff member of mine to actually learn and develop and grow and feel heard and produce something, or I see suddenly they move on to someplace else and now they're a manager, now they're running things. Like, I love those things. Um, so it's almost a mix of different pieces. I don't know. It's, I can't say there's one definitive happy moment that I have. With my depression not as an excuse, it's like the way I used to describe it is that when I get really sunken in to that hole, I could win the lottery and get the best news of my life and just nothing ticks. It's just, I'm there in this lull. So with that struggle over the last few years, it did affect my memory of it, I realized. And it did affect my um, ability to just be present. Um, so that's what I've been working on over the last few years. Um, so that's why I mentioned more moments than just a moment because, um, yeah, it's just uh, tough for me. And with different coping mechanisms, some that were bad versus the good ones I'm trying to adopt, um, it didn't help. But um, now, thankfully, I'm feeling better and happy where I am. The uh, process of coming out was really uh, challenging for me. Uh, so I came out. I came out in phases. I think I think that's a common story for a lot of people our age. Um, so I remember starting to go on AOL chat rooms, talking to people like the men for men rooms. I'm being very blunt right now. The men for men rooms, um, just chatting and with different people. I mean, I was like 15, 16, um, but I already knew something was there for me. Like I'm gay. I know that. Um, but my first time even approaching that subject um, was telling a couple friends that I was bi in high school. Um, but then because of my Christian upbringing, it was non-denominational. Um, what ended up happening is there were specific moments when I wanted to approach my life more honestly with my parents. And I, in a nutshell, had a whole bunch of gay porn that I was able to buy when I was 15, 16. I already had the beer, so I looked older. Um, they found it. Had a long conversation. I ran away for like a few hours, but this is from like two in the morning. So of course, 15 year old lost at two in the morning. It's, it was a nightmare when I got back. My dad passed out. My mom was crying. My sister was crying about everything. Uh, so my sister is bisexual and she was telling me about a crush that she had on this girl. And I would just kept denying it. I don't know what you're talking about. And with that, I started getting more heavily involved with the Christian church. So I became one of those who say, I used to be gay, but I'm not anymore. However, I didn't change to where I was suddenly anti-everything. Uh, something that kind of helped me, and it was so weird, is I started running a Christian club at school. I was the first one. It was the Hope Club at Clemente that they said it was the first one in a while to make it student-led. Um, but my friends were like atheist, Satanist, everybody, because I just wanted them to feel loved, even though I said I'm no longer gay. And then when I started going to church, um, I never wanted to date anybody, but I also say, if I'm going to school and I'm working and I'm going to church about five to six different days a week and I'm participating in different things, there is no time. So it wasn't that I was cured, it's that I literally had no time and I was very focused as a kid. Um, but then when I started dating somebody when I was 18, uh, I decided when somebody said um, that I might always struggle the rest of my life, uh, I went to a trip for work uh, to DC. And when I came back, I didn't go back to church. Um, mind you, that was a big deal because I ran uh, the tape ministry, the coffee shop, I helped with Sunday school, I was in the choir, I did special music, um, I helped with the youth group, I did night ministry, or not night ministry, um, night outreach, um, speaking to gang members, uh, drug dealers, talking to them about God, and, 
And so I went to Horizons, which is now Center and Halstead, but I went to Gay Horizons. I met some people for the first time. Um, some kid um, was like, hey, David. And David is one of my middle names. And apparently he thought I was another David, but that's how I suddenly started connecting with others. And so when I first came out, people knew me as David, which is why to this day, there's some people saying, why do they call you David versus Daniel? And it's because my other life, when I was coming out, I, I was known as David. And then the ones who knew me as Daniel, I had to come out to separately. Um, so it was a struggling process. And the one thing that actually helped me feel okay with my spirituality and myself is when I first worked at Kalor, I had a support group and they said, we want to learn about Christianity and homosexuality and what the Bible says. My first instinct was, well, I can tell you, but I didn't want to have that bias of my own. And so I did research and studied and I felt that I wasn't rejected. I felt that I wasn't wrong and I realized if I keep hearing what everybody says, then yeah, everybody's gonna say what they want. But doing that research, uh, I felt at peace with myself finally. When I was around, when that moment where uh, he, um, where I ran away for a few hours and he passed out, he would sometimes come to see me in my bedroom and have a Bible with, say it's a Bible verse about what I have to, talking about homosexuality or something. Um, or one time we were waiting to get food and I said, you know, shouldn't people be happy for themselves? And he said, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> we all know what that means. Um, so it was something to where I never officially said it, but I remember when I lived with a roommate, um, and then we would have other friends, like friends would come over, if not every other day, every weekend. And then one time my mom comes in and says, oh, look at all the guys without the girlfriends and without the boyfriends. And then when she left, my, my friends were like, what's going on? Um, so my dad ended up finding out, but without conversation because there was a guy I would date and uh, I was dating at a time when I'd move back in with them. And he would come to my bedroom, he would stay over, we would have dinner. Um, and then when we broke up, they gave me space and they knew something was going on without asking. So, but they were open. They weren't allowed, they weren't just denying it. Um, and actually when I got my first apartment at 18, um, I was having, uh, I was having a lot of fights with my parents and I had written them a letter that I had, um, that they're not going to understand because I'm gay and et cetera, et cetera, everything happening. Um, cause when I first moved out, I didn't talk to them for about two months. And then when I moved back into their building, uh, we used to have a lady that would help clean the house. And my mom says, she found the letter that I think that you wrote for me. And all I'll say is I'm disappointed, but we're not gonna talk about it. And it wasn't that I said I was gay that she was disappointed at. It's that I said, you're not gonna understand. Because she didn't change. She didn't react differently. She just showed me more love. My father, at the end of it, we never really discussed it. Um, but even, you know, going home and seeing him and I'd be at the, at the, I remember I used to drive and I, I, I worked close to where they lived. Um, so I would go there for lunch and then paint my nails and just talk about my day um, without batting an eye. Um, we just continue asking me how I'm doing. But also I never ever talked about people I dated, people I was interested in. Um, even if I was straight, I think I still would not have. There was something so, like I just felt like it was wrong, like growing up to date or be with others in that way to where that was not even conversations that I felt comfortable having. Um, so me to be open now with people, it's a drastic 180 from how I was back then. But with him passing, I do regret not just having a blunt conversation. And yeah, but I think that regrets are always gonna happen once we lose those opportunities. First thing was like bananas and pineapple juice. <laughs> like it's, um, like I'm not a big fruit eater, it's weird, but it'll, like with juices and as the post says, like just that smell and aroma is always like, it's inviting. 
It was literally a travel one day with my partner in a town where we can just breathe and relax, not think about work, not think about stress, and just be present. It's not easy. It's not easy. So to be able to do that and just feel okay, it's a dream. Hobby. Uh, I've been loving decorating my house. Um, even if you go to like the Vilsita office, you see things moving and it's, I want a space to feel like home. You know, I want staff to be proud of where they walk in. Um, but it's actually been the newest hobby that I've had over the last few months that continues. Um, so I, it used to be a lot of writing. I loved writing short stories or writing songs, um, been sketching again. Um, but the idea of creating a visual uh, representation of something that makes others feel good, um, I'd say that's the way I'll compact that hobby, just um, being creative. I'd say the first place uh, would be Bobby Loves. It's the last bar I was working at. And it's weird because even though I don't go as often, there was a lot of changes, nothing bad apart from COVID. Um, it's a place that allowed me to find myself and feel okay being myself. I'd say a fear of mine is losing more people that I love because of all the friends that I've had passing. Um, we were always shocked. Uh, sometimes we knew, or it would be one person in the hospital, we heard somebody passes. It's not the person in the hospital, it's the other person. A food, yeah, I think so much. Me encanta el mole que me hace mi mamá. Um, mole, or she makes like this, uh, this like, I think Russian style, like beef that has like nueces, pasas, um, like peaches, she makes it with cognac, she makes this uh, duck with this brandy, this orange sauce, so. Um, I love cooking too, but yeah, that's what comes to mind. I can be talk all day about food too. <laughs> There's one song that I've been playing recently, and it's, uh, it's from this artist called uh, Jack Garrett. Um, there's a song called Better, and in a nutshell, I'll say that song makes me think about, um, <laughs> um, it makes me think about an experience I went through last year mm -hmm. um, that I thought I would never get out of. I went to the hospital because I wanted to commit suicide. Um, I went the day before my birthday. Um, I changed my diet, my diet drastically, was in contact with my, my therapist. Um, I started taking group therapy. Um, it was Monday, Tuesday, yeah, it was four days a week uh, for about eight months, or eight months for eight weeks. Um, yeah, it was really fucked up. Um, yeah.